Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christian Marbach, Director of Student Ministries here at Faith. This week's message, The Heart of the Matter, The Relationship That Matters Most. Week two of the four-week series, Pastor Rusty talks about our relationship with God. Now, here's the sermon. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of this day, because every day that we have is a gift from you. Not every day from us seems like a gift. Sometimes they seem like a burden, a challenge. They seem to us to be altogether complicated and heavy. But Lord, you have given them to us, every one of them, as a gift to be enjoyed, but more than that, Lord, not just to be endured, but to be enjoyed and, and, and celebrated as we love one another, even as you have first loved us. We ask today that your power be among us, that your presence be among us, that your spirit guide, lead, and transform us, and that we reflect, Lord, the love that you first give to us. All things work together for good for those that love and trust you, and we love and we trust you. And in Jesus' name now, Lord, we turn to your word and seek your mercy. Amen. Okay. I've seen all three Toy Story movies. <laughs> and apparently some of you have as well, okay? And here's the thing. I am absolutely certain that there's going to be a Toy Story 4. And you know why I'm so certain? Because the Toy Story franchise has netted Disney over $2 billion. That's billion with a B. So I'm pretty certain there's going to be a Toy Story 4, and I won't be surprised if its title is Toy Story 4, Show Me the Money. Huh? <laughs> Show me the money. But you know, the Toy Story movies aren't really about toys. Huh? They're really all about... They're all about relationships. Listen, the toys in the movie are really nothing more than props. I mean, we all know a Woody, don't we? Someone who is kind of awkward, kind of clumsy, but they have a big heart and a lot of character. We all know a Woody in our everyday lives. We all know a Buzz Lightyear, somebody who's heroic, strong, courageous, and confident on the outside, but they're just a little bit insecure on the inside. But they're always there when you need them. And we all know a Buzz Lightyear. We all know a Mr. Potato Head. In fact, some of us are related to Potato Heads. <laughs> but that's all I'm going to say about that right now, okay? But you get it, right? The real draw, the real allure of the Toy Story movies is that they connect with the fabric of our lives. You see, Toy Story is really our story. Because it really is all about relationship, and we were created to be relational. I believe that with my whole heart, y'all. I believe that God has intentionally created us to be relational. But for those of you that need a little more scientific proof, that need a little more hard data, well then, I want to share with you that most secular social scientists agree that we are by nature relational. They would agree that we as human beings naturally crave and need social interaction. They would agree that this need, this craving, is both inherent and instinctive to us. And so they come to the conclusion that human beings cannot thrive alone. Human beings cannot thrive alone. We can survive alone for a while, but we cannot thrive alone because we will always be better together than we are alone. And you know why? Because we were created to be relational. Created to be relational. But we also know, right, that relationships are hard. Relationships are hard. Relationships take a lot of effort and energy. Many of our relationships can become messy and complicated. I mean, that was the truth in the Toy Story movies, right? The relationships that Woody and Buzz and the other toys shared became messy and complicated at times. Well, just as it was true for them, it's also true for us. A lot of times, our real relationships with our family, our friends, and our coworkers can become messy and complicated. 
because relationships are hard. That's why I want to share a little more data from some of the scientific studies that have been done concerning humankind like you and I. For example, those same secular um, social scientists that I talked about before also tell us that human beings, at least the average human being, is only capable of having or handling a maximum of 150 relationships at any given point in time. So, if you're bragging about having 500 Facebook friends or a truckload of Twitter followers, let me just tell you this right now. You might have them, but there's only room in you for 150 of them. So, good luck sorting that out, okay? But wait, there's more. There's more data. See, the same studies also show that the average human being really only has the capacity to have five people maximum in their inner circle. That is people that really know you. They know your isms, your schisms, and every dysfunction. They really know who you are. They're in your inner circle, and you can only have a maximum of five of them if you're an average human being. We all also have capacity to have a maximum of ten close friends. These are people who know you really well. But they may not know everything about you all the time, so they're not in your inner circle. They're, they're your close friends. And I'm telling you about these particular groups because, look, y'all, the studies show that these 15 people maximum, your five inner circle and your 10 closest friends, will take up 60% of your capacity for all social interaction. So if you're keeping score and doing the math, you know, 150 minus 15, that leaves 135 relationships. Those 135 others combined only get 40% of your capacity. If we were grafting it, it'd look something like this. So you see, there's only a very small percentage of your 150 total capacity. That's your five inner circle, your 10 close friends. But they take up, show the next slide, they take up a huge portion of your overall capacity to socially interact. So maybe that will explain for some of you why some of your relationships haven't stood the test of time. Maybe that explains for some of you why you had friendships that were really near and dear to you at one point, but you've now since lost touch with those folks. Maybe... Just maybe it's because they were part of that 135 and you didn't have the time to invest in them as much as you'd like to. Or maybe you were in their 135 and they didn't have a chance to invest in you like they wanted to or, or, or both. I don't know. But I realize that that statement can begin to bring some of you down. And I want you to understand I didn't come here today to bring you down. I, I really was sent here to build you up. But if we're going to build something that lasts... It needs to be built on a foundation that can be trusted. Am I right? Right. It's got to be built on a foundation of truth. So we've got to be honest with ourselves about who we really are as human beings. And one of those truths is this. There's a time for everything. A time for everything. In fact, again, you don't have to take my word for it. That, that appears in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. This is what it says there. There is a time for, say it with me, everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. It doesn't say that there's a time for some things and not others. There's a time for, for a few things but not all things. It says there is a time for everything and every activity under heaven. And that includes, y'all, the relationships that we have in our lives. Past, present, and even future. There is a time for everything. And the truth about our human relationships is this. They aren't just oftentimes hard or messy or complicated. Most, if not all, of our relationships, human relationships, also have an earthly shelf life. I mean, the fabric of our life is, is woven 100% in the relationships that we share, both with God and with others. But when we're talking about our human relationships, even though the fabric of our life is entirely relationship and relational, not every human relationship lasts our entire life. In fact, I guess I would say it like this. Every human relationship is a temporary encounter that has eternal value and implications. I'm going to say that again. Every human relationship we've ever had 
or have is a temporary encounter that has eternal value and implication. And by the way, I'm going to take a time out right here. You know, every week we provide for you a place in your bulletin to make notes about my sermon. And it always amazes me because I never see any of you taking notes. You must have incredible memories. Uh, you must remember every word. But, but I'm telling you this because some of the important stuff you might want to write down and take with you when you go today. And this is one of them. Every human relationship is a temporary encounter that has eternal value and implications. That's why today as we're continuing our sermon series entitled The Heart of the Matter, I want to talk primarily about the relationship that matters most. Maybe I should have entitled this sermon, The Relationship That Should Matter Most, because listen, i got to be honest with you. It is really hard for me to imagine a relationship that could matter to me more than the love that I have for my children. It's really hard for me to imagine a relationship that could matter more to me than the devotion and the connection that I have with my wife, Julie, who I will be married to for 28 years next month, y'all. 28 years next month. That, that ain't as long as some of you, but that's longer than most, y'all. I mean, so, so we're, we're ha I'm happy about that. And it's hard for me to imagine how any relationship could matter to me more than those. It's hard for me to get my head and my heart around that, that concept. But here's a truth that I've had to come to terms with. As much as those relationships I've named matter to me, the truth is... None of them have been a part of my entire life. I've had a relationship with my children their entire life, but not mine. And even though I've had a relationship with my wife for 28 years, and it probably seems like an eternity to her at times, the truth is that's just a little more than half of our lives. I haven't been with her my whole life. I guess I'm telling you that, y'all, because it leads me to, I guess, the heart of the matter for me when we talk about the most important relationship of all, and that's this. Those relationships that matter to me with my, my children, my wife, my, my friends, would be impossible without the relationship that matters most. There's only one relationship I've ever had permanently in my life, and that's with the God that loved me enough to create me. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the relationship we have with our God, the relationship that you have with your God, right? That's the most important relationship, of, or at least, at least it should be. Look, y'all, Christianity is not just a religion. Christianity is not just a compilation of rules and regulations and traditions. Christianity is meant to be a way of life in which we acknowledge God's demonstrated desire to be in relationship with us, and we affirm that we want to be in the relationship that God desires. That's so important. I am going to say that again. Christianity is meant to be a way of life in which we, one, acknowledge God's uh, demonstrated desire to be in relationship with us, and two, we affirm that we actually want to be in the relationship that God desires, that God desires desires. I mean, God has already demonstrated his desire to be in relationship with us. Y'all, in fact, consider this. God created you, and he didn't even ask your permission to do so. He just created you because. He created you because God wanted to create you, because if God didn't want to create you, he didn't have to, because God is God. He doesn't have to do anything. Everything that our God does, he does with intentionality. He created you because he wanted to create you. But he also created you because he has a purpose for you. I've said that before, right? Everybody is created for something, because the alternative is to be created for nothing, and nobody's created for nothing. Nobody. Some people are good for nothing, but that's a whole different sermon, okay? I'm just saying nobody's created for nothing. God created you because he wanted to, and God created you because he has a purpose for you. But more than anything else, God created you because he loved you, and he still does. See, we don't just have a loving God. You know, it's, love for God is not just an adjective, a descriptor. We don't just have a loving God. 
Our God is love. I mean, we hear that in the Bible as well. We'll flip back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. This is what it says. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is, say it with me, God is love. God is love love. He created you because he loved you. His love is the because behind your beginning. He loved you before he ever created you. He doesn't love you because of who you've become. You understand? He doesn't love you because of who you become. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how charitable you are. I don't care how compassionate you are. He doesn't love you because of who you've become. He loved you enough to make you in the first place. His love is the because behind your beginning. You were created from love, God's love, but you were also created for love, to love God back and to love others. In other words, you were created to be relational. You were created to be relational. God has demonstrated his desire to be in relationship with us by making us in the first place, but he's also demonstrated his desire to be in relationship with us by sending his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, the most well-known verse in the entire world, even outside of Christian circles, right? John 3, 16 goes, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting eternal life. God so loved the world. In fact, Martin Luther once said that John 3, 16 is the gospel in miniature. The good news in a microcosm. He also said that John 3.16 was the very heart of the Bible. The very heart of the Bible. Sounds a little bit like the heart of the matter, doesn't it? Because it is. It's the heart of the Bible. It's the heart of the matter. It's the gospel in miniature. God so loved the world. He demonstrated his desire to be in relationship with us by sending his son Jesus Christ in the first place. It's all about relationship. But you know what? There's a place in Jesus' earthly ministry that I want to point you to that that I think really kind of sums up in a very uh, clear and succinct way not only God's desire to be in relationship with us, but the kind of relationship God wants to share with us through his son, Christ Jesus. That, That appears in Matthew chapter 11. Let me get there myself. Verse 28, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. This is what Jesus said. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, did Jesus say, hey, come to church? Is that what he said? No. He, did he say, hey, come to your senses? No, no. Did he say, hey, Come to the, from the dark side. Did he say that? No. He didn't say any of that. He said, come to me. Those are relational words. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me when you're heavy and you're weary and you're burdened and you're broken and you're hurting. Come to me. I will give you rest. See, Jesus doesn't just want to, you know, be all about relationship, although he is. He doesn't want to just be a relationship that matters, although he wants to have a relationship that matters. He wants to be the most important relationship that we have because that is the most important relationship we have, the one that we have with Jesus. The one that we have with Jesus. Look. Y'all, Jesus doesn't want to have a seasonal, on-again, off-again relationship of convenience with us. That's just not the relationship he desires to have. Jesus wants to have a, 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 a forever friendship with each and every one of us. See, he doesn't want to be one of your 150 that you have the capacity to have. He doesn't want to be one of your 10 closest friends. He doesn't even want to be in your inner circle of five. He wants to be the most intimate, the most important relationship that you have. And he wanted it so bad that he died for you. Notice I didn't say 
He wanted it so bad he was willing to die for you. I bet you have some people in your life, or at least you've had at some time, that were willing to die for you. I can tell you right now, I'm willing to die for my children. I'm willing to die for my wife. I'm willing to die for my friends. I'm willing to die for the woodies, the buzzes, and even some of the potato heads in my life. I'm willing to die for them. Maybe you've had some people in your life that were willing to die for you too, but you've only had one person that actually did die for you, that actually died for you. And he died not just so that you would have eternal life, although that in and of itself would be enough to say amen about. See, he also died so that you might have joy and meaning and significance in your life right here, right now. He loves you that much. He said, come to me and I will give to you. Come to me and I will give to you. Come to me. Bring me your burden. Bring me your your cares. Bring me your hurt. Bring me your uncertainty. Bring me your fear. Bring it all to me, he said, and I will give you what you cannot give to yourself. I'll give you peace. I'll give you hope. I'll give you joy. I'll give you purpose. I'll give you a sense of significance because you are significant. Significant enough that Jesus gave his life for you. Come to me and I will give to you. But there's one other passage in the Bible that I also want to share with you that I also think captures for me at least this this whole relationship thing and this whole relationship that God desires. And it's actually found in the book of Revelation. I know some of you um, Bible nerds are saying, book of Revelation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." Nobody reads the book of Revelation, Pastor. That thing is confusing and scary, and there's nothing good about it. When somebody tells me that, that just tells me they don't know a thing about the Bible. Huh? Because I'm telling you right now, the book of Revelation does have some confusing stuff in it, y'all. And some of it is kind of, kind of scary. But the truth of the matter is it also has some truth in it that's important for us to hear. As a matter of fact, what the book of Revelation is is a vision that was given to the apostle John and what Jesus told him to do in this vision. And it was an, a vision in which he saw Jesus first and foremost. Jesus says, I need you to write some letters to my churches. And so what we're going to read from is chapter 3, verse 20, which is the letter to Laodicea. But I want you to hear before I read this, this isn't a letter to non-believers, people that don't know anything about Jesus. This is a letter to his followers. This is a letter to his people. This is a letter to people like you and I who were gathered together as the church. And this is what he said to them. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, well, then I'll come in and I'll eat with that person and they with me. Here I stand and I'm knocking. If you hear me out here knocking, let me in. And see, I want to share this with you because, listen, I think first and foremost this declares that Jesus doesn't want to be on the outside of our lives. He wants to be on the inside. But it's also key that we understand that we have to open the door and let him in. Now, I want to say something about this because I've heard a lot of preachers and teachers and even good Christian people that I love and and respect a great deal, I I think, understand this passage in a way that I'm not quite sure is, 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 is accurate. In other words, they would say, well, okay, so it all depends on you letting Jesus in. This whole love thing, this whole salvation thing, this whole acceptance and forgiveness thing. And I was like, no, 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 that's not what he said. I want you to understand this clearly, my friends. You were saved. You were forgiven. You were pardoned fully the minute he died on the cross for your sins. No ifs, no ands, no buts. However, what Jesus does say here is this. I want a relationship with you, and I don't want it to just be any old relationship. I want to be on the inside. I want to be the most important relationship, but if that's going to happen, you got to let me in. And let me tell you why I think he said it that way. He said it that way because he's not going to kick the door in like some intruder, and he's not going to pick the lock and let himself in like a thief. 
because that's not what love is. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we looked at that last week, right? It tells us what authentic, genuine, agape love is, God kind of love is. It says love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or arrogant or rude, right? But here's the next line, you ready? Love does not insist on its own way. Jesus says, I loved you enough to make you. I loved you enough to die for you. I love you so much, I want to be on the inside of your life. But love does not insist on its own way. You gotta let me in. If we're gonna have a relationship, he said, you gotta let me in. And, and, and that's what I need you to hear today. <coughs> I need you to hear Jesus saying to you and to me, let me in. Don't just let me in on the Sundays you decide to show up for church. Let me in to stay. Let me in in every moment of your life. Let me in in every situation of your life. Let me in on every relationship that you have. Let me in. You let me in, I'll stay with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never go away. I'll never forsake you. It's the only permanent relationship you're ever going to have in your life. I hope you understand that right here, right now. But while that's what Jesus is saying, what I was sent here, I think, to tell you is, practically, how do we facilitate Jesus coming into our lives? How do we open the door? <coughs> it's not just, thank you, Patrick. It's not just a figurative saying. It, it, it has literal, meaningful, practical application. So I just want to introduce a few ways in which I think we can facilitate this relationship Jesus wants to share and let him into our lives more fully. One of them is by worshiping weekly, y'all. And by worshiping weekly, I don't mean coming here to this house of God every single week. In fact, I've told you all before this, right? If I see you here 52 Sundays a year, you know what I'm going to say to you? Get a life. I'm going to say, get a life, take a vacation, go spend some time, you know, with family, friends, somewhere. Because I'm not going to be here in this place 52 weeks a year. But here's the thing, y'all. I can worship God in every place. I can worship God in many and various ways. There are other churches and other places I might go. I can gather for worship with Christian brothers and sisters there. Or you know what? I can worship in outdoor ministries like Briarwood. I mean, you know, there are places that I can do. Or, or you know what? There, there are, I can gather together with my family and friends anywhere, anytime, any place, and give God the praise, honor, and worship he rightly deserves. I'm not talking about you being here to worship every week. I'm talking about you taking time to worship every single week and let God in. Let Jesus in. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I promise I'll be there. I promise I'll be there. Another way we let him in is to pray daily. Okay, table prayers are great. Bedtime prayers, great. Even windshield prayers in traffic, great, okay? But what I'm talking about is, is an ongoing daily kind of prayer. That is what Luke, Martin Luther said. He said that our prayer life should always be a, a work in progress. It's something that we're constantly doing throughout our day. It's praying. Because you see, prayer isn't just us petitioning God for what we want and need. It's about communing with God and communicating with God in a way that, yes, we can tell him those things, but sometimes we just need to shut up and listen and let God speak. All he's really saying is that your prayer life will open the door and let me come in. And if you'll let me come in, I'll stay with you. I'll be with you. Reading our Bible daily. I talk about that all the time, y'all. Look, I, I just want to encourage you to read your Bible daily. And let me tell you why, y'all. Okay, because, because I want you to know the truth of God's love for you, but if you're really going to know the truth, you need to have, you need to have it from the source. Okay, come in here and hear me talk with you each and every week, and that's what I try to do. I try not to just talk at you. I try to talk with you. But just hearing me or others like me talk with you each and every week is not enough. You don't need to take my word for it. You don't have to take my word for it. In fact, you shouldn't take my word for it. Not because I can't be trusted, y'all, but because I'm only one man that sees only part of the, the picture. Don't you see the truth of God's love is so big 
that if we combined all of our perspectives, we still wouldn't have the fullness of God's love. You need to go to the source. That's why I want to encourage you to read your Bible daily. And I realize you got all kinds of excuses why you can't do that. You know, I got, I, I, I got time this, I got time that, I got schedule. Okay, look, you do some things every single day. I've said that before. You brush your teeth every day. God, I hope you brush your teeth every day. Hey, you know, there are other things that you do every single day. Then connect. Connect that time. Read it while you're brushing your teeth. Read it while you're in the bathroom. I know you've got other reading material in there. It's not sacrilegious to have the Bible in there. God knows you go to the bathroom, okay? I would rather you read it on the toilet than not read it at all. And so would God, by the way. So would God. Connect it to things that you do naturally every single day, if that's what it takes to get you started, right? But read your Bible every day because it's in the source of life, hope, and truth. This is a book of life for life that God comes in and he begins to change us. I think one of the ways we open the door for Jesus is by serving in our local church. I don't want you serving here because you feel like you got to. I don't want you to serve here out of duty and obligation. I, I want you serving here because I believe we're always better together than we can ever be alone. And I believe that the more we come together and serve the living God uh, as, as his church in this place, the more significance and impact we can have on our community. But look, look y'all, I don't want you serving out of duty and obligation. I want you serving because you feel like God's got a calling on your life. But here's the thing. I'm going to say this carefully, but I'm going to say it intentionally. If this is not a place you feel called to serve, then go find the place you are, seriously. Not because I want you somewhere else, but because I would rather have you somewhere else serving the kingdom of God than sitting here doing nothing. One of the ways that we open ourselves to, 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 to Jesus coming into our lives is to acknowledge the fact that we want to let him out through our service. Serving in your local church is one of those ways. And the last thing I'm going to mention is a way to open yourself to Jesus is by joining a small group. Again, we don't encourage you here to join a small group because we want you to check a block. You know, because it will make you somehow more worthy in the eyes of God. I want you to join a small group because it will be a way in which Jesus opens you up in a brand new way. Listen. All these things I'm talking about, the worshiping weekly, the praying daily, the, the reading your Bible daily, the, the working through a church, the, the small group, even if I were to talk about tithing, which I'm not going to today, so let your breath out. But even if I was, you see, all of these things are not things that God and I want from you. It's about what we want for you. I want something for you. I, Jesus wants something for you, not, not, not from you. He wants to give to you. He said, you come to me. You let me in. And I will give to you. See, that's the thing, y'all. Jesus said, let me in. And I came here to tell you how to let him in. But here's the last thing I want you to hear. He says that there's a payoff for letting him in. One of the payoffs is that you have a lighter burden. Some of the things that you think really matter, he'll show you that they really don't, and he'll highlight the things for you that do. But more than that, he will take the things that are too big for you to deal with, and he'll help you deal with them. He said in Mark 10, uh, let me get there myself. Mark chapter 10, that's after John, verse 23, there you go. He said in Mark 10, this is after a rich young guy had come to him, asked how he entered the kingdom of God. Jesus told him the rich young guy couldn't do it because he had too, many, uh, too much attachment to his things. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus again said, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, uh-oh, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it's impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Jesus says the payoff is your burden will become lighter, even the things that seem impossible for you because they're not impossible for me. And he also said your joy will be more complete. 
said that in John 15, 11. He said, I have said these things to you so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. And I came here to announce to you today, y'all, that greater joy comes from greater love. But if you're going to have greater love, then you need to have a greater source. And what greater source of love is there than our God who is love? Because I'm telling you, if you have greater love in your life, greater love for your spouse, greater love for your children, I know you think you can't love them more, but I'm telling you, you're wrong. God loves them more than you do. Trust me on that. You think you're devoted to them? God's much more devoted to them than than you ever will be. God loves them more. If you want to have more love in your friendship, you want to have more love with your coworkers, I know some of them are hard to love, y'all, but if you want to have more love, then you've got to have a greater source And the greatest source of love of all is God. He is love. Not just loving, he is love. So today, as we take our leave of this place and go back into our daily routines and lives, I want to encourage you to value the relationships that matter to you, to love on your family and your friends, to to go to work tomorrow and love on your coworkers. But more than that, I want you to take with you today the relationship that matters most. It's the one that makes every other relationship possible, the relationship you have with your God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to hear the truth of your love. It's not deserved, but it is your desire. It's a, it's a love, Lord, that we oftentimes can't comprehend and certainly don't appreciate. But, Lord, it is a love that is the because behind everything in our life. Every blessing, every source of joy, every source of significance, your love is our because. You've demonstrated it time and time again, but no more, no more visibly than your son, Jesus Christ. He isn't just the heart of the matter. He is your heart made incarnate for us. Today, we turn to him. We glorify him and magnify him. But more than that, Lord, We ask that you help us to follow him. To take him at his word. That if we'll come to him, he'll give to us what we cannot give to ourselves. That if we'll let him in, that he'll stay with us and eat with us and be our forever friend. He doesn't promise, Lord, that our life will be worry-free, trouble-free, burden-free. What he promises is that he will always be there to help us bear those burdens faithfully, to help us face those moments of uncertainty with courage, to help us, Lord, to not just endure this life, but to enjoy the gift of this life that it was meant to be. Thank you for who you are. Now make us your people. They glorify you, magnify you, and reflect your love. In the name of Jesus and for his sake, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. That concludes this week's message. The heart of the matter, the relationship that matters most with Pastor Rusty. If you would like to join us for one of our services, we are located at 6000 Morris Road, Flower Mound, Texas. Our service times are 845 for our traditional worship and 1030 for the contemporary. Hope to see you here at Faith.